everyone, and welcome back to Comic Book Issues. I'm your host, Brian Hines, the Last Angry Geek, and welcome back to the Big Blue Couch. Let me explain. I recently moved, so my old set is kaput. I've been setting up this new apartment. Everything's about ready to go, but I still don't have a filming area yet, so for now, I'm just going to be filming things on this couch. This is where I'll be doing the you-know-who reactions, but I'll find a little something nicer for comic book issues. Uh, that said, it is time for the November pull list, so let's dive right in with Heroes in Crisis number two, written by Tom King and drawn by Clay Mann. Now, this issue is really a very Harley Quinn-centric issue. In the last issue, we established that there was this sanctuary for broken heroes and even some villains where they could recover after traumatic events. Uh, but everyone there was dead, except Harley Quinn and Booster Gold, and each thought the other killed everyone else there. Now, in this issue, we learned that Harley's BFF, Poison Ivy, may have been there and she might also be dead. So this sets Harley on a path of revenge. She actually holds her own against the big three in a very tense moment. She's got this whole elaborate plan worked out because she blames herself for Poison Ivy going there to get the help she needed and then thus being at the sanctuary when the murders went down. Uh, we have to check in with Booster, and unfortunately, whereas Harley is becoming the best possible version of herself in this tragedy, Booster isn't. He's still kind of the bumbling idiot we know from 52 in his own series. Uh, he's got good intentions, but he's just not really great a superhero material. So he's kind of stumbling around in the aftermath of this trauma and kind of making things worse by that stumbling. Now, when issue one came out, I went online and said, I'm not sure I believe that Arsenal, Wally West, and the rest are all dead. And that would include Poison Ivy now. We're going to have to wait till the end of issue seven when this miniseries wraps to find out if they're permanently dead. Uh, my suggestion? By this book. Uh, it feels like it's really building towards something important that's going to affect the DC Universe. Uh, whether or not it turns Harley villain again or Booster turns out to be a murderer. There's something big happening here, it feels like. Uh, maybe that will turn out not to be the case, but that's what it feels like in these first two issues. It's been a slow build, which I like, and Clayman's art is just gorgeous. So my suggestion, buy this book. For week two, we have The Green Lantern number one, written by Grant Morrison and drawn by Liam Sharp. Now, a bunch of Green Lanterns in space uh, capture a bunch of pirates, a kind of alien gang. But it turns out there's some sort of conspiracy in the work against the Green Lantern Corps by the Controllers. They were the guys who established the Dark Stars back in the 90s. They're kind of like cousins of the Guardians of the Universe, but they want the job, so they're kind of working against the Green Lantern Corps here. Anyway, this gang stages a prison break. Their ship crashes on Earth, so for reasons that were explained in the previous writer's run. Hal doesn't have his power battery right now, so he borrows the pilot of the ship's battery and charges up his own ring and goes to take out the alien pirates. Uh, I like that he was smart about it. In one case, there's this one alien who can grow to be a giant, so he keeps kind of taunting him to grow bigger and bigger until finally his bones can't support his weight and his shins snap. Uh, other times, he just punches him. So I like that there was range to Hal. Hal's normally a fight-first-think-later kind of character, but here he uses his brain a little bit. Now... Grant Morrison has written some of my favorite comic books. Unfortunately, they're not superhero books. In fact, I think his superhero writing sucks. Uh, that said, if he writes the Green Lantern Corps as a cop show or as a kind of a, a, a sci using the sci-fi conventions instead of superhero conventions, this could work. Uh, Liam Sharp's a really good artist, but I just got off of him on Wonder Woman and Brave and the Bold, so I'm very used to seeing his art in a fantasy setting, not a sci-fi setting. And his art is very organic, for lack of a better term. And when I think of sci-fi, I don't think of organic, except maybe the thing. Uh, I think of, like, you know, precision and uh, clarity, and that's not his art. His art is not bad by any means, but it's not what I would expect from a sci-fi title. So my suggestion? Skip it. Both creators are out of their wheelhouse right now, and I don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. I don't know if they're going to sink or swim. Maybe wait for the first trade paperback on this one so the reviewers, like myself, can read that first arc and get a feel for what this book is about and where it's going. For week three, we have The Amazing Spider-Man number nine, written by Nick Spencer and drawn by Umberto Ramos. Now, this issue reestablishes the Black Cat as an ally of Spider-Man after Dan Slott had kind of turned her into a crime boss post-Superior Spider-Man. We get the whole what went down, why she got out. She's back to just being a small-time thief, but in the last issue, she attacked Spider-Man. Turns out she got involved with the Spider-Man version. Okay, Peter Parker and Spider-Man got separated into two people. 
So while Spider-Man was out partying and he was hanging with Black Cat, nothing too serious happened, but she kind of felt like he blew her off again. So they have to get that out of the way, and then they get on to dealing with the Thieves Guild, which is the current villains of the arc who have stolen a lot of superhero tech, like Cap's shield, Iron Man's armor, Hawkeye's bow. They're all gone right now. But while this is happening, I think even more importantly, Mary Jane runs into Carly Cooper, who was Spider-Man's first girlfriend in the brand new day era, and a character I absolutely hated. But she introduces MJ to this superheroes anonymous group run by Jarvis the Butler, where friends and family of superheroes can get together and vent anonymously to get things off their chest. And I think that could be a huge step forward for the MJ character, because Mary Jane's fear of Peter's life as Spider-Man uh, her guilt of not wanting him to do that kind of thing has always been like a huge factor in their relationship for like the last 20 years. If she can find a way to cope with those feelings and get them out in the open and deal with them, then maybe these two finally have a chance of working things out. I'll give Nick Spencer credit. He was handed a broken title that Dan Slott at the end had just kind of burned everything down and left it for him to pick up. And he's been doing his best to both rebuild and move forward. So... I like that right now he's dealing with MJ's insecurities, which were probably the biggest factor in their breakup, the devil notwithstanding. And while I'm a huge fan of Umberto Ramos' art, I know there are some people who just don't like it because of the heavy manga and animation influence, but I really like it. So I've got nothing to say for this suggestion except buy it. This is a fun book, and I'm enjoying Amazing Spider-Man more than I have in years. Finally, for the final week, it's Archie 700 by, again, Nick Spencer and drawn by Marguerite Sauvage. Nick Spencer is yet again taking over for another better-known writer, Mark Waid, who just wrapped up his Archie run. While Mark Waid was not afraid to make changes to the origin of Archie and his supporting cast, here it feels like Nick Spencer's trying to re-establish that origin, while what few changes he's making seem to be reflecting what's going on in Riverdale. Allow me to explain. Everyone's coming back from summer vacation, and now they find out that, surprise, surprise, Jughead has a job as a writer, just like in Riverdale. At the end of the issue, Jughead finds that the paper has been trashed and he's not sure who did it, so there's a mystery about Just like in Riverdale. Cheryl Blossom is having a party and wearing a short dress that shows off her legs. Just like in Riverdale. Okay, okay. Uh, so there are some things that are in question. Uh, Josie and the Pussycats seem to be having problems because of something that happened while on tour. Betty and Veronica want to get back with Archie, but he's kind of blowing them off and we see at the end that it's because he has a new girlfriend from the next town over who's certainly be... Which him. Eh? Eh? Okay. Uh, what few changes that were made seem to be reflecting what's going on in Riverdale. Jughead's a writer now. There's a mystery going on. It seems like Nick Spencer isn't going to reference what happened in the Mark Wade run, or if he does, it's all on the back burner right now. There's no mention of uh, Betty's car accident. There's no mention of Reggie doing some time in jail. There's no mentioning what happened with the Blossom's dad in the finale. So... That's where we stand right now. It feels less like a continuation of Mark Wade's run and more like a reboot. That said, Marguerite Savage's art is gorgeous. She really does great characters. It has a very Phil Noto quality to it, if you know what I mean. Uh, very clean, crisp, with nice colors. That said, Archie's hair was like hanging in front of his eye the entire time, and I want to just like, get that out of there. But that's a minor nitpick on my part. That said, my suggestion, uh, wait on this one, because like... The new team on Green Lantern. I'm not sure where this new team on Archie is going yet. If this is just going to be Riverdale, the comic book, I'm not interested. Uh, Nick Spencer needs to establish what he's doing, and I'll give him a few issues to do that. But for right now, I'd say don't get this book. I need to get a feel for where it's going before I can give you a clearer recommendation. Well, that's it for the month of November. I uh, thank you for joining me here, and I hope you're looking forward to seeing my new set. I certainly am. I have no idea what it's going to look like. But until I figure out what that is, thank you for joining me. I'll see you in December for the next edition of The Pull List. Until then, this is Comic Book Issues, and I'm your host, Brian Hines, The Last Angry Geek.